as an introduction, we, we all know if you've been to a church as a small child or been to a Sunday school somewhere, no matter what church you went to, uh, people would know the story of Samson. You know? And uh, the Bible says, you know, when he met this Delilah thing, you know, not Tom Jones's Delilah, the thing that he had. When he met this Delilah thing, she asked him, tell me the secret of your strength. Then he told her a lie, and she said, tell me the secret of your strength. He told her a lie, and the third time she said, I've asked you now three times to tell me the secret of your strength. Now, if you were in Sunday school, they would lay all the emphasis on the man's hair, you know? And I remember the longer my hair grew when I was young, the worse I got, you know? I didn't get better with my long hair for those who were in the hippie days. So my long hair didn't make me stronger. It made me weaker. The longer my hair grew, the more I did stuff that I shouldn't do. But, it, it, you know, because the hair is not the thing. Just listen to this. This is going to be great. The Bible says in Judges 14, the last couple of verses, and the Spirit of the Lord started driving Samson. And the word J is the same when the Spirit drove Jesus into the wilderness. The Spirit of the Lord came upon Samson and drove him amongst the Philistines. Okay? Then it says, Judges 15 and 16, over and over, the Spirit of the Lord came upon Samson. And he slew those 30 that, you know, got the riddle with the lie for those who don't know. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon him and he slew 1,000 Philistines. And the Spirit of the Lord, and remember, and then he said to this Delilah thing, you know, he told her, you know, you know he, what is the secret of your strength? Everybody say the secret of your strength. Okay, so Samson gave the secret away. The Bible didn't say he recognized that his hair was cut. The Bible says the Spirit of the Lord departed from him. Okay, and then in Judges 16, Samson prayed this prayer as he was a prisoner in the Philistines' camp, and he said, O oh Lord, once more give me my strength. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and he got a little guy to lead him to those two pillars. And you know, the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and the strength returned. So what was the strength of Samson? The Spirit of the Lord. So what is the real strength of a Christian? The Spirit of the Lord. So I pray that you will be strengthened with might in the inner man. That you may come to know. Okay? So there's a power that's supposed to work in and upon us. And it's not the power of outside powers. It's the power of the Spirit of the Lord God coming in and upon us. And so many times, you know, we're strong one day, weak the other day. And I just feel God wants to speak to us about the restoration of the anointing anointed life or the anointed life restored and to keep it going there psalm 84 i believe it is says in verse 5 6 and 7 it says the people that really knows the spirit of the lord they go from strength to strength and when they go through desert places they make it to river man wherever they go there's rain and god says they the people of god that understand righteousness and know the spirit of god they will go from strength to strength so we don't have to be up and down yo-yo Christians, you know, we need to go say from strength to strength. Okay, when we think of the book of Joel, in, in the book of Acts, when the Holy Spirit was poured out, the Bible says in Acts chapter 2, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there was a sound from heaven like a mighty rushing wind that filled all the house. And you know, there were seen of them cloven tongues of fire that divided themselves and set up each of them. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and started speaking in other tongues. And when Peter stood up and the people were amazed, he says, This is that. Spoken by the prophet Joel, but he only quotes two verses. And I said, my goodness, Joel has got more than two verses. Okay, so if Peter quote, let's quote the rest. Put your hand in your Bible, say, this is God's holy word, anointed by the Holy Spirit. I am the person that will hear what the Spirit has to say. My life will be changed. I will be an anointed vessel of God. My life will be anointed. I will go from strength to strength. This word will come alive. Kubus will preach under the anointing. I will hear under the anointing. And this is the anointed time. Okay, so let's look at, you know, we know verse 28, 29, and 30, and 31 that Peter quoted on the day of Pentecost. But let's look at verse 23. Be glad, ye children of Zion. 
Rejoice in the Lord your God, for he hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain in the first month. And in Zechariah 10 verse 1, he says, Pray ye the Lord for rain in the time of the latter rain, because God makes the lightnings and he will give you showers. Okay? Hosea chapter 6 says, God will come to us like the rain if we just decide to know him better. Okay? So, he says, he will come to us like the rain. Verse 24, and the floors shall be full of wheat. And the vats shall overflow with wine and oil. Now we know oil speaks a lot about the anointing, Old and New Testament. When it comes to oil, we can put in the Holy Spirit. right? And I will restore to you the years. I will restore to you the years that the locusts have eaten, the canker worm, the caterpillar, and the palm worm, my great army which I send amongst you. And you shall eat in plenty, you shall be satisfied, and the last words, you shall never be ashamed. So, uh, are you ready? If God says, I will restore to you the years. That means, if I get restoration of 40 years, I am only 12. If my years are restored, it means I'm getting younger. If God restore your years, it means everything that I lost through years, through aging and stress and anxiety and fear and beatings and fightings and sicknesses and turmoil. Everything that I lost in years, when it's restored, it means I'm getting that back in time. And before you know it, I'm 30 at 56. Huh? Okay. Oh, people under 30 sleep. Everybody... How it? Come on now. It's just those that are in this category now. How would you like yes. to be 30 at 60? Yes. How you would you like to be 25 at 711? Come on, man, somebody in the house. The rest of you, how would you like to stay there between the 20s and the 30s? And not look like your old man. When God talks about the old man is crucified, it's not your dad, okay? It's the life that you lived in the Lord. So if, if, your years is, if your years are gonna be restored, and one of the, the words they emphasized is, and it'll be overflowing with oil. It means you will have a young life which is anointed. Come on, how much people, you know, they fast and they pray and they go from meeting to meeting and conference to conference and year by 84, they eventually anointed. Man, it took me a long time. But if I lay my hands on you tonight, God is going to bless you. I know when I was a young man, I sought the Lord, I fasted, I prayed, man. But now at 84, I can feel the presence of the Almighty God. I mean, how would I have loved to be anointed at high school? I mean, there's Johan, we were in class together and in the same room from standard 6 to standard 10. That means from grade 8 right through grade 12. We knew nothing about God, man. Was there anybody that talked to us about Jesus in school? Hey, you want, nobody talked to us. We were in a boys' school of 900 boys. On a Monday morning, nobody said, hey, church was good on Sunday. <laughs> I will not tell you what they said, what was good on Sunday. Yeah, you know? The closest we got to Bible was in the hostel. When the, the teacher on duty after a meal knocked on the table, tuck, 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 and he said, let's pray. And he would pray something that meant nothing for our souls. That, how would I have loved to go back and be at the age of 18 what I now know at 56? 
I mean, I would see that teacher tell me, who broke the chairs in the room this weekend? I was like, oh, okay, forget it. <laughs> I will not tell you anything about our school days, but I can tell you what. How would you like to get your life in reverse and whatever you learned in Christianity, have it and can apply it at that young age. Now, God's more or less is this. I'm going to restore the years that has been taken away from you, that's been devoured out of your life. And I'm not going to just give you back those years. I'm going to give it with an abundance of overflowing oil. So you'll not only be young, you'll be young and anointed. In Exodus 22, we don't have to go there. We're going to go to... Job 42. But in, Ex uh, in Exodus 22, the Word of God comes and He says, when everything's, anything is taken away from you, and it's found out that it's been taken away from you, it'll have to be restored to you. He says, and the minimum it can be restored is twice or double or twofold. But it can be restored like fourfold. Fivefold, even sevenfold in the book of Proverbs. So God says the least you can get back is twice as much as been taken away from you. I think that's quite a good deal. God's saying, I can give you back twice. Now, that is if the thief is found out. If he's not found out, you can't get your restoration. But luckily, here comes Jesus. And he says, the thief comes to steal to kill and destroy John 10:10 10, 10. but I have now come that you might have life and have it more abundantly so Jesus says I've got the thief and when I'm crucified we're going to get rid of the thief and when I come back to life on the third day this will be restoration time and I'm going to give you abundance of life youth renewed with very much anointing flowing in it okay so the best example is Brother Job. So let's go to Brother Job today. You know where Job is? Just before Psalms. Now, we know the story of Job. He was a very rich man. In fact, the Bible actually said he was the richest man in the East. And we know the story how Satan came and told God, you know, Job doesn't fear you for nothing. And he, and he, and he you know, he accused Job before God. And remember how Job lost everything. At the end, he sat on the ash heap, you know, and the dogs came and licked his sores. His wife left him, his children, everything. There was everybody departed from him. Now look at the brother Job. He says in verse 4, I had virtually said to you what you have said to me. Here I beseech you and I will speak. I will demand of you and you declare me. I heard of you only by the hearing of the ear, but now my spiritual eye sees you. Therefore, I loathe. You know, the word loathe is looking down, you know, in a bad sense to something. I loathe my words and abhor myself and I repent in dust and ash. So Job says, God, whatever I said in this book was a lie. It wasn't you that made me sick. It wasn't you that took my stuff away. You are a good God and you want to bless me. I lied when I said you were bad. And so he repented. Verse 10. And the Lord turned the captivity of Job and restored his fortunes. Okay, listen to this. When he prayed for his friends, also the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Now the next verse says, the bottom the part of the verse, every man came and gave Job money. And every man gave him an earring of gold. And the Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than his beginning. In the beginning, the Bible says in Job 1, he was the richest man. Okay, Verse 13 says he had also seven sons and three daughters. Verse 16, after he had all this, he lived another 140 years. And so his sons and his sons' sons, even to four generations. When God restored Job, and he had another seven sons and daughters, and he got rich again, more rich than he was in the beginning, after he got everything restored double, where he had 5,000 yoke of oxen, now he had, you know, 500, he had now 1,000. Where he had 7,000 donkeys, now he had 14,000 donkeys. Everything double, married again, 
got those seven sons, daughters, and after he got that all back, he lived another 140 years. I mean, that's some good restoration. Now, I can't see Job coming out of his sick bed. <laughs> you know, or, you know, I don't know how long it was. You know, but he lost everything now. You know, his sons was already grown up because they were already farming. So he wasn't too young when he lost everything. Now imagine him going through his sick bed, lose everything, lose. Now imagine coming him now, and now he's getting married. Yeah. Yeah. Now he gets seven more sons in that state. Or daughters. Now he gets rich again, and now he lives another 140 years. What must the dude have looked like? So I believe when God says restored, God restored his years. And when Job came out of the stuff, he was a young man all from the beginning. And he married a fresh like a young man, got seven sons and daughters, lived another 140 years after he got everything. That's some kind of restoration. Okay? So what will be the power of this restoration and strength? So let's go to Psalm 92. Remember I told you in the beginning of they go from strength to strength, Psalm 84, and what was the strength of Samson, how he lost his strength, how he regained his strength by the anointing of the Holy Spirit. But my horn, my emblem of excessive strength, my emblem of excessive strength, stately grace, you have exalted like that of a wild ox. Now it tells us how his excessive strength got through, because I am anointed with fresh oil. Okay, remember when God restores us, what's going to happen? There's going to be an overflow of oil, which means an overflow of anointing. The word fresh there is the exact same word, which is green in the Bible, like green, which means fresh. You know, when a plant is green, it's a fresh plant. It's a tender plant, etc. for those who want to know about it. Okay, Psalm 52, I think it verse 8. He says, I will always be like a green olive tree in the house of the Lord. I think it's like at Psalm 52. Verse 8, I will be like a green olive tree in the house of the Lord. You know why? Because I trusted in God's mercy. Okay, verse 12. The righteous shall flourish like the palm tree. They shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon, majestic, stable, durable, and incorruptible. Verse 13. Planted in the house of the Lord, they shall flourish. Remember Psalm 52 verse 8. I shall be like a green olive tree. Green means fresh. Olive means anointing oil. I shall be like a fresh anointed person in the house of the Lord because I trusted God's mercy. Is somebody with me? Okay. He says, planted in the house of the Lord. 14, growing in grace, they shall bring forth fruit in old age. They shall be full of sap, of spiritual vitality, and rich in the verdure of trust, love, and contentment. They are living memorials. Okay, they are not tombstones. Come, 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 come. Come, Donny. They are living. Who's the living memorials? The people that are anointed with fresh oil, that are planted in the house of the Lord like a green olive tree, that know the power of restoration of strength, that know the power of anointing of the Holy Spirit. They shall be full of sap no matter how old they get. The vitality will always be there. They shall be living memorials. Oh, I remember. We got the cloud of witness. We got some guys there. You know, some good guys there on the wall. But that's dead memorials. You know, that's tombstone memorials. This is on a tombstone in England. It's just on a tombstone. So this guy, I don't know what he went through to have it inscribed on his tombstone. He says, Once upon a time, I want to tell it. Okay. Let's <laughs> run.
Once upon a time, long, long ago, in a land far, far away, there was a woman who never complained, never moaned, never found fault. But you must remember, it was long, long ago in a land far, far away, and it only happened once upon a time, right? So, huh? I didn't want to tell it. You forced me. I just said, and you say, tell it, tell it. I didn't tell it out of my own. You forced me. You put pressure on me to tell it. Okay, verse 18. Forgive us. Okay. Verse 15. They are living memorials to show that the Lord is upright and faithful to his promises. He is my rock and there is no unrighteousness in him. Anointed, green, fresh, young, strong, because of God's mercy, because of God's grace, and because you know the righteousness of God that's been bestowed on you. Listen to the book of Job. Now you must understand, Job had a lot and he lost everything. You must know where we're going to. He regained everything twice, got sons and daughters, money and wealth, and another 140 years. That's a good deal. That's a good deal. Now we're going to just back up and look at a few places in Job's life. He says in verse 3, Oh, that I knew where I might find him. Oh, that I might come even to his seat. Okay, look at me. Hebrews 4, 14 through 16 says, We have a high priest that can be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. He was in every way tempted like we are yet without sin. So let us come boldly to the throne of grace that we might receive mercy. Now we just heard that you must grow in grace in the Psalms and because we trusted his mercy, we shall be like a green olive tree. Now listen to Job. He says, if I only knew where I can find him, if I only knew how to get to that throne. Listen, people, this is going to be cute, man. Oh, good, whatever you want, okay? He says, I would lay my course before him and I would fill my mouth with arguments. I would learn what he would answer me. Remember Job 42? And I would understand what he would say to me. I would that he would plead against me with his great power. Would he plead against me, excuse me? Would he plead against me with his great power? No. Go to the King James. Will God plead against me when I come to his throne room? When I go to the place to pray and ask God, will he come against me because of all the wicked? No. He would put strength in me. Somebody must realize we serve a great, good God. He says, if I can find out where I can find God, if I can find out how to get to the throne of grace and mercy. Now we know what the New Testament says. You see, you know what I will find there? No matter what I did, no matter how I behaved, God is not going to come against me when I find him. He's going to put strength in me. He's going to restore me and revive me and bless me and take his bottle of oil and anoint me. Okay, listen to verse 7. There the righteous one who is upright and in right standing with God could reason with him. So I should be acquitted by my judge forever. So Job is prophesying. He says, if I can find that place, everything that was wrong, he would forgive me. He would say, you are forgiven. There's nothing I got against you. And you know what you find by me? I'm going to put strength in you. Isn't more or less what we find by Jesus? He has forgiven us all our sin. He has made us the righteousness of God. He says we can come boldly to the throne. We can find grace. He's going to give us mercy. And whatsoever we ask, we'll be able to receive from him. He's going to clothe you with righteousness. Remember Isaiah 61, where Jesus quoted when he walked into the synagogue, the spirit of the Lord is upon me for he has anointed me. And then it goes down to about verse 10. He says, you know what he will do with us? He will clothe us with a robe of righteousness. 
And now Job says, if the righteous man find that place where he can enter the seat room where God's throne is, you know what's going to happen? He's going to put strength in you. He's going to strengthen you. You know what the strength is? He's going to revive you, restore you, strengthen you out of weakness, put oil on your head so that you can be young and anointed. I think it's a bargain deal here. So remember, he's going to clothe you with robe of righteousness. 2 Corinthians 5.21 God made him who knew no sin to be made sin for us so that we can be made the righteous of God in Christ Jesus. Now let's go to Job chapter 29. Verse 14. Are you there? I put on righteousness and it clothed me. Clothed itself with me. My justice was like a robe and a turban or a diadem or a crown. Verse 20, my glory and honor are fresh in me, being constantly renewed. And my bow gains ever new strength in my hand. Okay, now I made a study of this for those who think, you know, if you see how I preach, you must know I do read the book. But I made a study of this bow once, and this is what I found out. Whenever the Israelites had to go to war, they said, get a young man that can span a bow and put them in the front. Okay. Job says, when God strengthen me and renew me, I'm going to have a bow. In other words, what he's actually saying is, God's going to give me the strength of a young man when I realize I'm clothed with righteousness, I can enter his throne room. The thing is, he's going to give me the strength to span a bow and be like the youth. The Bible actually says, find youth that can span a bow and put them there in the battlefield. Thank you. Let's turn back. It's still chapter 29. But verse 1, Job continued his parable and said, Oh, that I were as in months past, as in the days when God preserved me, when his candle shined upon my head and when his light I walked through darkness, as I was in the days of my youth, when the secret of God was upon my tabernacle, when the Almighty was yet with me, when my children were all about me, when I washed my steps with butter and the rock poured me out rivers of oil. Somebody you listening? Job says, I wish I was young and anointed again. Like I was. What happened in 42? He was young and anointed. Now, for those who are sitting here, you can't find these scriptures with concordances because they haven't got the same words in it. So it must be I sit and say, God, and God speaks, and I write, and then I stand up and say, God, help me to help the people to understand what you showed me. Because there's not the same words that you can follow it in a, in, a, in a concordance. There's not the same type of words that you can follow it in a dictionary. So it must be God putting the scriptures together and say, I want to make you young. I want to make you strong. I want to anoint you. I want you to be so full of vitality and strength without BioPlus. Verse 23, God's voice may be heard. If there is for the hearer a messenger or an angel, an interpreter, one among a thousand, to show to man what is right for him, how to be upright and in right standing with God. I'll put it to you out of reading out of 26 translations. He says, if we can find an intercessor that would tell man you are now righteous. We have an intercessor that made us righteous. Okay? You see, if we can, then God will be gracious to that man. And he will say to him, deliver him from going down into the pit. Because, listen to this, I have found a ransom. A price of redemption and atonement. Who do you think they're talking about in the book of Job? Thank you, church. Listen to verse 25. Then the man's flesh shall be restored. It becomes fresher and more tender than a child. He returns to the days of his youth. 
He prays to God and is favorable to him so that he sees his faith with joy because God restores to him his righteousness. Is there anybody want, that wants to decay, get older, get corrupted and fall at Makarate? Anybody? Is there anybody who wants to say, hey, I'd love to, you know, just, you know, I'd love to be 16 at 56. Anybody? I don't say do what you did at 16. I said, you know, have the strength. When you were, you know. My goodness. My goodness. Then Eliphaz. Are you glad your, aunt is, your name is Kubis or your aunt or something like, you know, you know Eliphaz the Temanite. Are you not glad? You, you know, answered and said, if we've got to listen. If we venture to converse with you, will you be offended? If I would get a book from the bookshelf that talks about Job, it'll try to motivate you how to go through trouble, motivate you in your calamity. But if I read the book of Job, it's a victorious story of a man that heard that God wants to restore youth to people, anoint them with fresh oil and make them to be A1. Right. Verse 2, if we venture to converse with you, will you be offended? Yet who can restrain himself from speaking? Behold, you have instructed many, and you have strengthened the weak hands. Your words have held them firm, has held firm him who was falling, and you have strengthened the feeble knees. Everybody said, you've strengthened the weak hands, and you've strengthened the feeble knees. Job with your words. Oh, come on, come. Here comes Eliphaz. He said, you know, Job, you're going to be offended if we tell you who you really were. There was a time when anybody whose hands was weak, whose knees was weak, you were the one that always strengthened them with your words. Job, get your words in order. Stop saying what God is doing and start saying what God is doing. Don't give God the blame for what the devil is doing. It's Satan that came in front of God. It's not Jesus that came in front of God and says, Slut for Yopni. Yeah. Now, in the end, it says, God changed, you know, the captivity of Job. Okay. But now it has come upon you. Now, now the trouble is on you. And you faint. You are grieved. It touches you. You are troubled. You are dismayed. Okay. See, in other words, Job, get your words right. Think, I beg you, verse 7, who being innocent ever perished? Or where were those upright and in right standing with God? Where were they ever cut off? So if I understand my right standing with God, God says, I will not cut you off. I will not reject you. I will not refuse you. If you understand that I paid a price for you on the cross, you know what's going to happen if you come to the throne of grace to find mercy? You know what's going to happen? I'm not going to change your job. I'm going to, okay, I'm going to strengthen you. I'm going to anoint you. I'm going to give you back your young life. I'm going to give you strength. I'm going to anoint you. You're going to be like an ox man. You're going to be wild, full of fire and energy and vitality. Come on, somebody. Aren't you tired and fed up to get your strength out of a bottle? Hmm? 14 vitamins and 24 minerals. You know, you know, you know. You know, you know, you know, I mean, you know, Vital Lift, Janet Lift, Bio Plus, Turbo Vite, Red Bull, Green Bull, Blue Bull, Blue Blood, you know, I don't know what in earth, you know. You take that thing half an hour later, you feel like Superman. Four hours later. You feel like Peter Teeth after he went into the Gans hut. Okay, so. Right, Hebrews 12, as well as Isaiah 35, as well as Job 4, yeah. Job 4, verse 3. You have instructed and strengthened the weak hands. Verse 4. By your words, you have strengthened the feeble knees. Are you ready? Hebrews 12. 
Ach, Hebrews, yeah, Hebrews 12, verse 12. Easy to remember, 12, 12. It's better than 9, 11. So then, <laughs> brace up and reinvigorate and set right your slackened and weakened and drooping hands and strengthen your feeble, palsied and tottering knees. So we're jumping right into the New Testament with the same scripture. Cut through and make firm and plain and smooth straight paths for your feet. Make them safe and upright and happy paths yes. that go in the right direction so that the lame and the halting limbs may not be put out of joint, but rather be cured. <laughs> Don't you think that's good? Isaiah 35. The wilderness and the dry land shall be glad and the desert shall rejoice and blossom like the rose. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice even with joy and singing. That's the happy song. The glory of Lebanon shall be given to it, the excellency of Carmel, Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord, the majesty and splendor and excellence of God. Strengthen the weak hands. Make firm the feeble and tottering knees. Say to those who are a fearful and hasty heart, be strong. Fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. With the recompense of God will he come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened. The ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. The lame man shall leap like a heart. Come on. The tongue of the dumb shall sing for joy. For water shall break forth in the wilderness. Streams in the desert. In other words, verse 10, And the ransom of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. Are you not fed up? With the sighing and the sorrows and the hurt and the heartache and the sickness and the pain. Now, every scripture led up to God says, be strengthened. Amen. I'm going to strengthen you. I'm going to heal you. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to restore you. You're going to be young and anointed. You're going to be like, woohoo. <laughs> Isaiah 30. Do you know that Einstein, Al Albert, Einstein, not Einstein, Einstein, <laughs> Einstein, you know, E equals MC square, the dude that had it up here. Okay, Einstein, he had a cousin. What was her name? Kesgen. Who is Kesgen? He had a cousin by the name of Kesgen. And she was very worried about her uncle Einstein because he was getting older. And one day she came home and there was a guy with a motorbike standing in front of Einstein's house. And Einstein was just walking up the steps and this guy wanted to meet this cousin because she was like attractive and you, you know, and he, he sort of liked her. And when they looked at each other, you know, She looked at the motorbike and she looked at Einstein and he walked up the steps and he was whistling. <laughs> he was an old man now. And she said, you, you had my uncle on your motorbike? You know? And this is what happened. As they were driving with a motorbike, Einstein felt... You know, he said, if we can travel at the speed of light, we'll stay forever young. Remember? <laughs> Remember the story? <laughs> and then he said, you know, if time is no more, why should we worry? Let's be happy. Because if we can travel at the speed of light, we'll stay young. So we were sitting in the back of the motorbike, and you know, he was a little scared the first portion of the road, and then he started feeling what, you know, he sort of thought what happened when you travel at the speed of light, and he, you know, let go of the guy in front, and he stretched out his arms, and as they were going to the motorbike, he screamed, Wahoo! And he got off the motorbike, and he said to this guy, I can't remember when I felt so good. 
And here's his cousin. You had my uncle. And I'm, you know he could have had a heart attack. You know how old he is. He said, you know what? When your uncle was on the back of that motorcycle, he screamed, Wahoo! She said, he did what? He looked at her and he said, when was the last time you said, Wahoo! <laughs> Don't let life pass you by. Join the, join the Nissan company. Life is a journey. Enjoy the ride. I still can't think how they got the revelation, but it's all right. Okay, Isaiah 30, verse 15. For thus saith the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, in returning and rest shall you be saved. In quietness and in confidence shall be your strength. But you would not. But you said, no, 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 no. We will flee upon horses. Therefore you shall flee, man. And you said, we will ride upon the swift. Therefore shall they that pursue you be swift. One thousand shall flee at the rebuke of one and the rebuke of five. So oh, at the rebuke of five shall you flee till you be left like a beacon upon the top of a mountain as an ensign on a hill. Do you want, I mean, you can pick that up in Jeremiah 17 as well. And do you, do you want to be like, you know, a flagpole without a flag on top of a hill that doesn't say anything? God says, Ajeb yo perkiklum, you. Okay, this moral is this. God says, hey, you must be in, in quietness and rest. You're going to find strength. But you said, no, give me my horse. You know the old saying? You climb up your parky. Is there something like that in the English vocabulary? What do they say? On your high horse. Yeah. Yeah, mount you. Saddle up. Hmm? God says, if you want to saddle up your horse instead of being quietness and rest, you know what's going to happen? People's going to put you to flight. You know what's going to happen? You're going to end up like a flagpole without a flag on top of a mountain. You will not be able to say anything. You can't even say, we won all lost the war. You'll just say nothing. Okay? <laughs> Listen to this, what God is saying. But God says, God will wait because he wants to be gracious unto you. Hmm? He wants to have mercy upon you. Come on, people. Verse 19, For the, the people shall dwell in Zion and Jerusalem, those shall weep no more. He will be very gracious unto you at the voice of your cry. When he shall hear it, he will answer you. First Peter 5, for the last scripture. Okay, everybody, you know, I preached this once in Afrikaans, long, long ago, far, far away. I preached this sermon not this sermon, I mean the scripture in a sermon. And I had like, you know, a broom there. And I said, you know, forgive us just five minutes in Afrikaans, two minutes. I said, and I grab your iPad for you. And I spring your iPad. I said, skid iPad, do it. And a young little girl, okay, in English it says, you know, get on your high horse. In Afrikaans it said, just get on your horse. That means you strip yourself, you know, you blow a gasket, you know. You know, you know that stuff. And... But God says, quiet, quiet, peace, rest. This is where I want to help you. And I said, take that horse and shoot the thing, man. And a little girl in the front row started screaming. Why does he want to kill the horses? Why does he want to kill the horses? <laughs> true story, true story. I thought I was very explanatory in my sermon. I thought I was really showing them, you know, out of life's, you know, wisdom that God taught us through the years. But, okay, quietness and rest. Don't saddle up your horse. And you know what God says? He says that I'm going to strengthen you. So listen to 1 Peter 5, verse 7. Cast all your cares upon him. For he cares for you. 
Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. Whom steadfast, resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. But the God, you've got to listen to this, of all grace. Okay, there is saving grace. There's grace for miracles. There's grace to understand you're righteous. You must learn out of the New Testament how many times grace is mentioned with something else. Now the God of all grace. Not just saving grace, healing grace, financial grace. May the God of all grace. I hope somebody will get it. May the God of all grace who hath called us into his eternal glory by Christ Jesus. After you have suffered a while. Now listen. May the God of all grace make you perfect. Establish you, strengthen you, settle you. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. May the God of all grace perfect, perfect you, establish you, strengthen you, settle you. The God of all grace. I hope somebody's getting it. Psalm 119 verse 28 says, O God, strengthen me according to your word. Okay? Psalm 103 says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget none of his good benefits. He forgives all your iniquities, heals all your diseases, crowns your life with goodness and mercy. Listen to this. Satisfy your mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed like an eagle's. Okay, I hope somebody gets your mouth. In Numbers chapter 12 to 14, the children of Israel had to go spy out the land. Ten spies come back and says, we can't take it. Two comes and says, if God says we can, then we say we can. That means we can. 45 years later, 45 years later, Joshua 14, verse 11, Caleb says, Today at 85, I've got the exact same strength as I had at 40 because I put the word of God on my mouth. Because I trusted God. Then you book, at 85, my strength is exactly the same as at 40. How would you like to become 16 at 60 tonight? How would you like to be strengthened with might? How would you like to see all sickness, pains, diseases, problems go? God says he wants to heal you. He wants to save you. He wants to bless you. Hope's going to sing, I see a land, and then we're going to pray. And I trust after this word that you're going to take it and say, Lord, if that's your word, I'm going to take it. I'm going to be strengthened. I'm going to be empowered. My youth is going to be great. No more sickness. No more disease. No more pains. God is not a liar, people. There must be more to the church than look sick, lame, and lazy. Yes, amen. That was for the army if you didn't want to do anything. But truly, God wants us to be alive and full of vigor and energy. Man, we must be able to do more now than we did at our youth. Why must we gain all the knowledge and then go to the grave? Just when you learn how to do it, now you're old. Can't be, man. Can't be. Can't be. I said to the young people the other day, you don't need a Ferrari when you're 87. You need it when you're 18, man. Why is it that young people must pay off on something that's already falling apart? I mean, our first cars, we didn't know that they're supposed to take us somewhere because we pushed them more than what they took us. (laughs) Remember those days? Hmm? (laughs) We did. We thought it was okay to push a car. You know, we didn't know self-starters were supposed to work. We thought it was a luxury. Thank you. We didn't know that there was something like a new battery. (laughs) 
my first Beetle had the engine removed every Saturday. It came in for engine overall, Saturday after Saturday. We looked at that crankshaft and took a file and sandpaper there. <laughs> you know? And had a box of rings, see which one fitted best, you know? Put it in and it goes for another week. We thought it was great. No problem taking it out next Saturday. At least it went for a week. Hmm? We did. Hmm? If the car overheated and the top got whopped, you know, we just took a ruler and checked, you know, where's the gap and took a file. <laughs> you know? Then put ply bond and grease on and, you know, not talk wrench. You know, tighten that thing till you can't tighten it anymore. And then we go for another week. Why can't you have a decent thing when you're young? So change it around. Why now that you have a decent thing, can't you be young? <laughs> Come on, somebody need to clap for the revelation. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think that's great. Thank you, God, for giving us such a mind that can. Huh? I see a land. It's barren and dry. And these men. 